Hey there, really excited to have Stench Needles on uh, on my Total Bitcoin podcast show. He's a brilliant writer, he understands Bitcoin, the economical forces behind it, the principles. He's a really uh, fascinating uh, young uh, man, uh, 23 year old, uh, according to his own uh, Twitter handle, who lives like a retiree, he says, thinking doing slow walks and writing essays in cafes. He learns about, he you know, goes into rabbit hole of physics, quantum physics, he studies philosophy and, and of course Bitcoin. And um, check out his, uh, his blog or website, limitlesscuriosity.com, where he writes brilliant in, uh, essays and articles uh which i've heard you know other um, in you know uh, bitcoiners or investors or what have you are really impressed by his work so really looking forward also to have him on the value bitcoin conference here in vienna on march 5th 2020 and during the panel discussions which i'm gonna also co-moderate yeah um so without further ado this is my interview with Sven Schneiders. We'll talk about Bitcoin, Austin economics, technical aspects, critical adoption, um, and the fundamental questions, you know, uh, of this, um, you know, of this matrix we're living in. Uh, all right. So if you have any questions, let me know. And thanks so much for support and for listening. Hey, Sven. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for your time, man. I've uh, been waiting for this interview for a long time till, so we can do this face-to-face -face in really highest quality um, uh, format. So, Sven, you, you've made a pretty good impression on a lot of people, uh, what I've heard. <laughs> thanks. Um, a lot of known, you know, whether it be investors, research analysts, in, or, you know, Austin economists, Bitcoiners. Uh, so I'm going to start off, uh, let's start off with your latest article. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot the title of it, but it had to do with the fundamental properties that it was the, about the question is, I'm going to paraphrase it, whether gold, let's just start off with gold, um, can compete with Bitcoin. Is that right? Correct? Yeah, it was definitely one of the, the main, main issues, let's say the I wrote about in the essay and it's I can try to quickly say summarize what I what I tried to get across and the the fundamental question is why do why do we need Bitcoin and why do we why do we need to also run a full node and keep our own keys? That's basically the the main question I try to to lay out. And the the answers are basically monetary sovereignty and liberty if you if these two things are important to you then you will you will need bitcoin you will need to have your own keys you will need to run your own node that's basically the the premise and with like how it relates to gold it's basically the the sovereign aspect of, of Bitcoin, mainly that you can run your own node. It, this is the biggest difference to gold. In gold, you can also transact with anyone. No one can tell you like who to transact with, at least locally. But you cannot verify the gold you get. You don't know, is it real? How real is it? And for that, you need a quote-unquote gold node which is obviously expensive and you need the knowledge to verify it and it's impossible in practice so that's basically the, the the biggest difference that I laid out in my essay because Bitcoin lets you do that with an easy full node. So then before we go into detail into the rabbit hole of you know this whole uh, economical monetary properties why don't you tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, what's your, <laughs> what's your journey to Bitcoin? Um, yeah, where do you find yourself? Yeah, so I'm I'm 23 and I'm I'm studying here in Vienna, but I got into Bitcoin basically when I was still living back in Germany, and I was I was into stocks and 
all that kind of stuff. And a friend of mine actually like kind of, I heard of Bitcoin and I watched some videos about it in, I think back in 2016, start of 2017, I think. And yeah, but I didn't like, I didn't follow up on it. So I forgot about it. And then a friend of mine was into it and was into all all the crypto market, let's say. And this was like end of 2017 when, when a lot of people got into it. And yeah, that's when I got into it as well. But you know, it's from, I, I started research end of 17 and then start of 18, let's say, I, I started uh, getting really involved in it and reading a lot and yeah, that's that's basically how I got into it and how I got also then into Austrian economics and all the all the rabbit hole stuff with cypherpunk, privacy, security. I do have a lot of interest in, let's say, com computer science and I do some some programming for fun. I'm not that great at it, but I try my best. So that's that's basically where I come from and where my main main interests lie in the in the computer science and economic aspects and how they work together. You have a pretty diversified spectrum, right? Of <laughs> passion, interests. I, <laughs> that's yeah. I, I I mean I do I do just read a lot. I I just read all day basically, and that's that's where you that's that's how you find yourself in the these diverse um, areas. I would say if you're a curious person and that's uh, what my first essay I wrote about um, is about about curiosity and how it relates to learning and stuff so I'm really curious about a lot of things and then I just read a lot of things and think about them and then recently I've tried to write about them as well because it helps you clarify all your thoughts and you you get really yeah, you you it's even for you personally even if no one like no one thought my essays were any good and just uh, didn't care like i would still be happy writing them because it helps me a lot to think about you know, complicated topics like bitcoin or physics mathematics computer science philosophy all of these kind of branches where i'm interested in which all those fields and beyond are indispensable for the comprehension of the overall holistic understanding of Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I would, I would definitely agree. It's a lot. One interesting aspect of Bitcoin is that it is so difficult to understand because it has so many fields and you can, you can come from it from the economic side, which a lot of people do. A lot of people were Austrian economics first and then got into Bitcoin and uh, saw it from this angle. But a lot of people also got into it from the like cypherpunk computer science route. And that's like, there's a lot of different things, where even with game theory and some psychology in it and the incentives that work there, and which is, I guess, microeconomics. But there's a lot of different stuff to, to understand. That's, that's why it's so like interesting to me because every, every time you think way, wait, I, I got this figured out, uh, I know what's going on. You discover, no, there's, there's, there's a lot more to understand, basically. Awesome. Um, Sven, before we dive into the fundamentals of what is money? Why do we need money? What is Bitcoin? Why Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Can I just briefly ask you, do you think it's time for individually and as a society and civilization as a whole to question the very fundamentals, uh, no, let me, let me rephrase it. The, the fundamental legitimacy of nation state, government, regimes, banks, central banks, or the, you know, central, every centralized structure you can think of, um, not only ethically, but really constitutionally, uh, legitimate wise. I, I mean, I think it's an interesting question and I do. I do do think it's kind of getting to the point where a lot of m a lot of people, a lot more people, are seeing that most institutions and 
even like normal big biographies, like all of this kind of stuff, like o organizing, centralizing, planning uh, society or any any big project for for that matter are failing a lot basically and and they don't they don't deliver on anything they they don't do they don't do any good so i do think that a lot of people are seeing that and i do think bitcoin helps in this in this overall scheme of things that people can realize there is a there's another way to doing things there is a decentralized way Bitcoin has shown that, or Bitcoin is continuing to show that with money. And I do think it's, money is, for me, the most important part of this whole puzzle, let's say, of centralized nation states and how to how to deal with that problem of governance and how to, let's say, govern people. But for people that are, let's critical of the nation state and, and want, want to whatever destroy or take it down or fragment it what, whatever the uh, goals are i do think bitcoin is the best way to start because you can um you can shout at people all you want and say to the government that they should be small or they should do x or y but i don't think it's going to happen i think it's going to happen in a way bitcoin does it where you just stop paying them you just they don't have any money they don't create any real value for people and that's how this whole structure is likely going to fall in my opinion and that's why i'm also not not a big activist at all because i don't see any value in it i just it's pretty difficult to vote for someone you think shouldn't have the job in the first that shouldn't be his job so it's kind of it's all uh, pretty difficult, but I'm I'm glad Bitcoin gives us this great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Let me yeah let me let me go a little bit deeper. Um, do you think when once you know the the parameters the conditions are set, you know externally and the environmental you know monetary economical conditions that we are we have, once Bitcoin as they call it ossifies you know as I would call it the monetary root layering you know, be becomes rooted, do you think that the political structures and all the other, you know, uh, the circus around it could become obsolete, like governmental structures, in not in totality, but substantially, just yeah. become obsolete? I, I completely think that. I, I, do, I do see people underestimating, in my opinion, obviously, um, how much is going to change if we had a different or if you have a hard money like bitcoin and what makes it so hard uh, explain <laughs> to our listeners what is hardness what is what are the fundamentals of yeah all right so let's let's try to get into it a little bit so hard money basically means that you cannot make like what we have now is just some 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 money but it's you can print infinite amount of money and the the property of hard money is it's difficult to create it's hard to create more of it so that's that's bitcoin bitcoin has a fixed supply 21 million and there, there ain't going to be a single more bitcoin than that so that's uh, extremely hard people are obviously talking a lot about gold which is also uh, extremely hard because you can only you can only uh, dig up a certain amount of gold in let's say a year and this is a really small amount compared to the supply, which is already there, uh, like circulating. And that's where also the stock to flow ratio, which has gotten really popular, comes from. So basically you need a high stock and a low flow, meaning a low new supply each year or each month. And that will make money hard. So gold has a relative scarcity. Yeah, it's it's it's. it's and really hard but it's obviously not as hard or as difficult let's say uh, to create as bitcoin right now it is uh, more difficult but after the next halvening the uh, the block reward gets cut and bitcoin is going to be the hardest money or the most it's going to be with the highest stock to flow ratio let's say okay in order to understand the potential the real potential of bitcoin where do we start 
What, what's the misconception? Why is it so hard for most people to understand the really fundamental properties, monetary properties of, you know, yeah. of hard money, of hardest money? I think the... I think the biggest problem is that people just don't don't see that need. They just don't know what they're missing basically or don't know how bad the monetary system actually is because it's uh, I mean it's a catastrophe and it's 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 really basically all all the banks do and stuff it's people don't realize how how much that contributes to their the their situation as individuals and that basically if people keep on printing money and th this money is not going to be distributed equally for example like those who are close to banks and hi high up in whatever institution prints money they're gonna get the money first they're gonna be rich let's say and until this money is distributed to all people it's uh yeah, the, the the person who gets it last is going to be uh, the worst. Like for him, it's not going to be great. He doesn't have, yeah, f he doesn't have anything to gain from this uh, printing of money. So that's I think the the seeing this this fundamental let's say injustice in my opinion is for me one of the biggest reasons I'm so so bullish and so so grateful about Bitcoin because I hope and I do think that this is going to change and that's a great thing now i wrote a, a couple of articles not so famous as yours but <laughs> about you know B bitcoin versus central banks and because i really went into the also history the let's just call it criminal history of the international bank for uh, bank for international settlements now before we dive into the technical requirements you know or user-friendly you know question what, what would you say to a potential noob or Bitcoin beginner? You know, it's, let's say, you know, the curiosity is there. You know, uh, you know, you find an open-minded person who says, "Okay, let me, you know, let me try this out." First of all, what would you, what would you say to this person, to this noob? Why? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult question, obviously, and I'm, I don't know if I'm the best person to like talk to noobs about it because for me it's sometimes difficult to understand how people think that uh that are basically not not that far into it let's say but i would definitely like i'm a big fan of Saifedina Musa's book for for this reason because it's really the history of money and then in the end it's some bitcoin and it's not starting with bitcoin and how awesome Bitcoin is and all the technicalities and everything. It's basically starting with why we need it and what happened in the past, as you said. And I think that's a really great place to start. If someone is curious, just give them this book and hopefully they will see what, what I saw, let's say, when I read this book. And also uh, without being like too, too, too much fanboying for myself, but I hope my article helps as well. If you uh, if you starting out and don't know why why everyone is so so grateful for all this liberty and sovereignty that we get with using Bitcoin, then I hope my article or my essay helps there and shows you why you why you need that too and why you would want something like. Bitcoin and why you need to run a node and need to hold your own keys. So that's basically how I would start. In progressive phases, like, uh, you know, old Bitcoins or OG Bitcoin, or, you know, Bitcoiners who have been here in this space for a long time. Uh, and it's true. I mean, it used to be really hard, difficult to get your hands on Bitcoin, right? I mean, it used to be really difficult. You had to be, I don't know, go Mt. Gox and then went to, you know, true, got yes. hacked or whatever. And uh, you had to really have some technical still, uh, skills. But nowadays, let's just say buying Bitcoin and hodling Bitcoin is pretty self-explanatory. Would you say just for hodling, just for buying and hodling, that's it? I mean, I, it's definitely gone a lot easier and this is definitely important um buying obviously using the cash app for example to just uh, dollar cost average bitcoin is really easy anyone can do it hodling bitcoin is 
in the, in the easiest sense, obviously not difficult. There are some problems though with doing it the right way, let's say, meaning doing it secure and doing it hopefully also in a more private way than just buying it on Coinbase and worst case scenario, letting it on Coinbase. But mm. second was just um, putting it on a hardware wallet, which is fine for beginners, obviously, but I just hope that people who who understand it more and more uh, see why just having it on Coinbase or just not caring about privacy is is bad and we we need to change that as it says a community and to try to to educate like the new people on on these important things so no one can obviously expect them to understand everything at first and just just use wasabi wallet mix their coins with the first buy no one's going to do that but it should be a progressive thing like getting people first to take them take the Bitcoin off the exchange and then, oh, maybe I should coin join, maybe I should care about privacy, maybe I should use a different hardware wallet, a more secure one, and all of these kind of things. Okay, because it's really not easy, right? I mean, user experience, user interface, it's so important, the features, the operations that sh could maybe eventually become more and more by default uh, without having, you know, this required thinking process and really you got to take care of a lot of in-between steps right? yes, especially yes. setting up your node or coin mixing coin joining uh, for most people yeah, yeah. I, I i would agree it's really difficult for most people especially for people that don't have let's say the little programming background where i'm coming from with some like python coding and stuff and using command lines is for me not difficult but for for most people it's obviously really hard and this this needs to change because even nowadays if you use a mixing service or if you use let's say wasabi you you need to you need to look out for a lot of things you need to you need to know about coin control you need to not reuse your address you need to not mix when you spend unmixed and coin joint coins and you need to, it's not easy it's you need to you need to take care of a lot of things and this is hopefully soon going to to be automated as much as possible obviously and i'm i'm definitely definitely grateful for anyone doing doing the work there but as i've already tried to kind of outline in my essay is that this is only half of the work technical improvements are great especially when it comes to user experience. But the other half is telling people how important it is to care for those things. So they they invest the energy, they invest the time to, to learn about them to, oh, maybe I look up what coin control means, what, what, what are UTXOs and stuff. Sure, everything is gonna get easier, but there's still going to be some burden on people to just do it themselves, learn it themselves. It's not going to be completely completely without effort let's say uh you mentioned auto dca that's auto uh, auto automatic dollar cost averaging it took me a while till i understood the term because i thought always it's relative to a certain time period that you measure within a week a month you look at the price but it just means a regular yes accumulation yes. it doesn't matter what the price right yeah the the and point is the you just accumulate over time basically you just buy whatever like every saturday you buy uh, what 50 bucks of sets automatically say, automatically and you don't touch it that's that's the most important point that you just don't do anything don't trade you don't <laughs> trade don't don't try to time it you can you can dollar cost average let's say and then if you think the price is super low today buy a bigger chunk buy right? a bigger chunk let's say but don't do this kind of, don't try to time it too much, let's say. And that's, that's really where, I mean, m stacking sets is, is becoming a bigger thing. And that's great because th that's what people, especially new people should do because no one knows what's going to happen with the price. So just keep accumulating, keep buying in, in certain intervals and 
you're gonna do great. Exactly. And shout out to Hass McCook, who has been advocating out at ECA for such a long time, and proving, you know, by with numbers, right, uh, by calculating for people who who would have been, uh, you know, out at ECA or accumulating over time, that they're always better off, you know, than people who are just constantly whatever, you know, selling, buying, and and and, and, and you know, trading. Yeah, this is it's really those analyses are really showing that it's extremely difficult to be better than just buying every week. It's really, it's really, really difficult. You need to hit those couple of days where, where, where Bitcoin is really cheap. You get a lot of sets for you, for your weird USD or whatever you had got. And I, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I, I don't trade anymore. I, I kind of used to, as I said, I don't do it anymore. I don't think, especially for new people, they should even think about it just buy and buy regular amount dca stack sets but invest your time in education don't don't invest your time in learning how to trade and invest your time to learn how to bitcoin basically and not not some other stuff so what would you do what would you say to a noob you know how to you know, get the first taste. What would be like the first really technical? Would it be a mobile wallet for now, like, like a block string green wallet, or get yourself? You know, would you prefer like? Would you recommend definitely? You know, one or two. I mean, most most of. I mean, all of the exchanges are KYC, right? So, non KYC, it's either really difficult or I don't know to yeah. operate. And what's a full node? Why a full node again? Yeah, I mean, as so a for for new person let's say coming into it i don't think you should worry that much about let's say like know your customer laws and all of that stuff on exchange because as you said all of the big ones at least all of the ones where where a new person's going to buy bitcoin they are kyc so i think it's best to just get them into it at first is the easiest way if it's Coinbase, if it's Cash App, whatever, then they have some Bitcoin, then they have like, skin in the game, let's say, and then you can you can you can try to educate them on how to do it better next time, how to like not use maybe use BISC, which is pretty advanced, but you can you can try. I don't think it's really a reasonable expectation to to convince people before they like buy their first Bitcoin or something to like. You have to do it this way. You have to use BISC. You cannot do this. You, this is going to scare a lot of people. And I don't think it's a great way. I think you should do it like progressively, get them into it, get them to buy something and then educate them how to do it better next time, how to do this, how to run your own node and all of these things. But it takes time. You, you cannot expect anyone to like just do everything right the first time. That's just how it goes. I mean, I'm a big fan of, you know, of all those plug and play stuff. So Casa, you know, shout out to Casa. I mean, I have myself a Casa too now. It it took me a while because it still had some, you know, technical problems or, you know, internet connection or it, you have to reboot it. So, but it's still, it's still a plug and play full node and you get yourself like a multi-sig. So, you know, it's an additional security layer instead of just putting it on a hardware wallet. Um, now again, why why a full node? What, what do you need a full node for? Yeah, so that's that's where we get basically, that's where we get deep into it. So full node for those who people who let's say don't know is the full transaction history of Bitcoin. Meaning from the first transaction in the first block, which is the Genesis block, you get all the transactions, which is a lot of data, and you verify every single one by yourself on your own pc that it fits basically that it follows all the rules let's say and if you've done that and take some time uh, you can then verify all transactions that come in they are broadcasted basically in the bitcoin network that they fit your rules that they they don't let's say that the miner who mined the block didn't say oh i want more bitcoin for my mind block let's let's give me 100 bitcoin reward how about that no you can you you got your own node you got your own rules and you're only going to accept those transactions and those blocks that confirm to all the rules you have agreed to basically by running the software 
you can run the software however you want, which is something we are probably going to get into it later, but a lot of people don't understand. You can do whatever you want. You can change the software, whatever you want. You can change all the rules. No one cares. It's, it's, it's your note and you, you decide. But if you change the rules in a, in a weird way, let's say, that is not compatible with everyone else, no one's, you are not part of the network anymore. So you don't get all the benefits of being part of it. So that's basically what a full note lets you just do everything by yourself, verify everything, and lets you basically claim, as I've said, uh, your monetary sovereignty, which is you don't have to trust anyone else. You just trust your own note, listen to your own note, and that's it. So it means this is the process or the path to becoming a totally self-sovereign um, Bitcoin or, or you know, taking real control and self-responsibility. I think it's a, maybe it's a huge challenge for a lot of people, especially when it comes to securing your own private keys, you know, taking care of your own privacy, security, and validating essentially with your full note, self-validating every transaction and the principles of um, of Bitcoin, right? Let me yeah, I, I do. It's it's a huge step for, for a lot of people. And it's, I think, where, where the distinction for me comes in from people that are just Bitcoin investors and let's say, quote unquote, real Bitcoiners, people that care about the values that, that are sovereignty and liberty in the monetary sense, obviously. And this is where, in my opinion, as I've said, the education comes in. You need to explain to people why it is so important to be sovereign and you, to have the liberty, to have the freedom to transact with anyone. Because if you, let's say, have, you, have your Bitcoin on an exchange, you cannot transact with anyone. You have to first take it off and then, let's say you have it on your hardware wallet, then you can transact with anyone you want. No one's going to tell you uh, what transaction to send to whom. But the before, if you have it on Coinbase, they might ask you to identify yourself, let's say, or as we've seen in the past, exchanges don't like it if you send your Bitcoin to Wasabi Wallet because they think it's evil or they, want, they don't want anything to do with it. There are a lot of weird stuff going on. So if, if, you, if your Bitcoin lies on an exchange, as, as, the, as the, let's say, popular saying goes, not your keys, not your coins. So it is not your coins. It is not your money when it's lying on an exchange. You have to ask permission from the exchange. And it is important to understand why, why you want this, this freedom to transact with anyone, because most people, especially living in all the Western countries in America or Germany, or Austria, where we are in right now, people obviously think they have the freedom to transact with anyone. It doesn't happen all the time that you, that the bank says, no, I don't want you to do transaction X or whatever. But it does happen sometimes, and those cases are pretty pretty severe. And as I've as I've tried to uh, lay out a couple of times already, it's it's stuff like WikiLeaks, let's say, where, where, where Visa and Mastercard and PayPal are just just shutting down all transactions to WikiLeaks and trying to basically silence them uh, from publishing and trying to. Uh, yeah, trying to basically censor them that way, which this is this is all the all the examples like this are are the reasons you need this freedom. You need to hold your own keys so that you can transact with anyone. Because if you need to ask permission, you it's not it's not your money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a big fan also of uh, the Samurai Wallet. You know, with its Whirlpool coin chain. Now they are you know right now working on implementing or integrating the mobile mixing right so it's going to become easier it's privacy privacy technology is going to be, become more easier and and especially it's going to become uh, the sort of the coin the mixed coins uh, going to become sort of in this in this green green uh, indistinguishable from 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 the non-mixed ones so do you i mean then you know then you know especially when our attitude collectively changes like we should actually re take care of a private we should coin mix so 
Yeah, I I agree. It's it's getting a lot. It's especially on the privacy front, which is in my opinion probably one of the bigger challenges. Let's say for Bitcoin fa- facing it right now. It's getting a lot better. A lot of things are getting done by Samurai or Wasabi. And it is important to get a lot of people into it because, as you've said, if or if a lot of people have also pointed out that if only some portion of people mix and use CoinJoin, it's, it's it's not really it's not really great for those who do because everyone can see right now basically if you coin joined or which transaction are coin joined transactions and people are saying like oh i don't want those coins they are coin joined they they this is going to be some illegal stuff or whatever people say so that's difficult but when everyone uses coin join regularly or every transaction is a coin join basically um yeah that that's not going to be a problem and um, people have will have to let's say accept those coins and exactly. that's going to be great and then it's become well, like fungible right like real cash and then you know you can't say this is tainted this is not tainted i mean it's total bullshit right so yeah. um essentially uh samurai uh also has this ricochet function where there's like hops it's like unlinking like bring more distances right i mean can you elaborate yeah, yeah it's uh basically the problem which i've which a lot of people have pointed out is i've Let's say you're an exchange and you say you don't want any coins who are coin joined. Well, what does it mean? How 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 big has to be the gap basically be- between the last coin join and when you get the coins? Because let's say I'm 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 someone who doesn't coin join, and you you just uh, I just want to send my Bitcoin to Binance, but the guy before me who sent me my coins for the work I did, let's say, coin joint, and then Binance says, "Yeah, well, we don't take coin joint coins, but obviously it's not my thing. I didn't coin join. I I just got the coins, and that's basically the the whole premise or the whole problem. And that's how you get uh, exchange. That's basically how we can quote unquote fool exchanges. You just do some hops in between. You just coin join." And do just some self send. You just send your coins over and over to yourself. Obviously, not reusing addresses. And yeah, then there's no point in saying they were coin joined. You can just, especially with the fees right now, you can just do 20 transactions in between. At best, with some random intervals and random times and even random fees, if you want to be really secure. And then no one can. There's no. There's no. No clear-cut line. If if the exchange says, yeah, we don't take coins that are coin joined in the last whatever, twelve transactions. You just do fifteen transactions, and you, your coin doesn't count as coin joined anymore. So there's a lot of things people can do, and obviously, software developers are, are doing too combat this kind of weird tainted uh, bitcoin scenario and i it's gonna get a lot easier i think and it's it's definitely it's definitely needed that's that's what i would say all right so before we um let's before we transition again maybe going back um to you know the the misconception (laughs) um when it comes to also to gold uh, you know the gold bugs um any other like technical operational privacy security um aspects you it's you think it's important to communicate you mean in the difference that between gold and no uh, just just bitcoin? for bitcoin just for the you know for the for this progressive phases of buying hodling security privacy um, um i mean yeah i think the i think the the, the, the most important things is just that you hold your own keys and that you run your own node and then you can worry about privacy and obviously security and how to do that all safe but getting people to basically take responsibility which is what it is about uh, for their own situation their monetary situation the monetary uh, monetary life let's say 
is is the first and most important point and that's where a lot of what i try to communicate starts basically that's what i i try to try to tell people that they need to take responsibility and show why 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 they can't just let anyone else do yeah, i'm gonna let the, this bank control my money or this exchange it's fine I, I don't have to worry about all of this stuff and so that's that's where i where i focus a lot let's say and it's also i i do think that some people maybe especially people who are really n not technical at all especially right now shouldn't hold their own keys i agree definitely with that and it might be even the case in the future that uh, people they just who shouldn't hold their own keys because they will lose whatever they they would make all sorts of mistakes i'll say but these people should at least know know the the trade-offs that come with it they they should know if i don't hold my own keys and if i don't run my own node what are the trade-offs what am i missing out and what am i basically the ease of use that i'm gaining from letting the bank or the exchange hold my coins is it worth it or isn't it and that's basically the the decision everyone has to do by themselves but i want to try to make it in a really informed decision that's all all basically so there's services like you know nux custody i interviewed tibu marashal you know so they provide or you know offer insured let's say what's called i don't know semi-custodial services with multi-sig so you don't you're still not you know in custodial service but you have two out of three or three out of five keys or like in casa you've got you know two out of three or three or five uh, what's your take on that um i do think it i think it can be great and i do think what people are trying to do at casa is definitely a great option between completely doing it on your own and completely letting someone else do it there are the, there are some i'm i'm more critical than most i would say about all of the solutions because people the theory behind it is great the problem is the practicality and the problem is really how to verify that the person they hand the keys out to is, is the person who the keys belong to basically so how do you identify yourself is it fine to just go there with your id and show them that or What's if a person stole your ID and stuff? That you know, all some of the things people have to think about a lot more, in my opinion. And they are not that that hand wavy, let's say, to to get rid of. But I support every uh, let's say innovation there is in the space, and every everyone trying out new things, and everyone trying to to um, make it easier to hold and uh, basically get Bitcoin. But I'm more obviously for myself and for for the people I know, more of a fan of doing everything by yourself, just being completely self-sovereign, knowing how everything works, and that's basically my my journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely um, advocating also for. I mean, I think these services are are innovative entrepreneurs or you know, companies like Cos. I think they're trying, you know, first of all, make it easy, user friendly, and and prevent sort of. Uh, the, the worst case scenario instead of you know losing it totally at least you have you know if you lose one key then you still can recover with whatever your mobile wallet and or your the other hard wallet or if it is three out of five or whatever right so it's yeah. sort of a trade-off right it's sort of a balanced trade-off i think they're trying to achieve yeah i i i agree and i i do think it's it's um definitely great what they what they try to do I I would say that they should maybe communicate more the difficulties that I've lined out and maybe also like for whom these services are really for and how much money you should basically um maybe let in those in those services or like just say put half let's say with Casa in this multisig and do half yourself or like a any of those things I don't I don't think you should do everything with Casa, but it's 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 really a difficult decision that everyone has to do on their own and with their own situation, own technical knowledge. And I I really appreciate what what they're trying to do as entrepreneurs. It's obviously great. Great. Okay, let's go back to 
you know, there's, um, I had those guests all, also on Dr. Markus Kral, Dr. Thorsten Polleit. These are really amazing, brilliant Austrian economists, libertarian, free market advocates, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, strong advocates and, uh, you know, of, of the gold uh, standard. What is it that, what would be the common denominator between the Bitcoiners and gold bucks or gold advocates of free market, go, you know, gold market, um, gold yeah, standard? I, I mean, the, the, there's a, we obviously, Bitcoiners and gold bucks obviously like discuss a lot and bash each other all the time, let's say, but there's a lot of common ground we have. Basically, what we have uh, alluded to in the beginning, the hard money and that we need to take the control basically for money out of the banks or let's say out of the like government more specifically. So they don't, they can't just print more and more money. And that's basically a lot of uh, common ground we have and also that uh, inflation is not really needed that much as for example case in thing and all of this stuff is really really clear to all of those people but there are the devils in the detail basically so how to achieve those things that we all agree on and why we need gold or in my example bitcoin for it is where we differ and we differ a lot on that i guess Mm -hmm. If we went through a checklist uh, of the monetary properties or you know properties in general, where do you see like fundamental differences or yeah. co common knowledge? Um, I I do think the the commonalities are obviously that what I've alluded to as the low stock to flow ratio, basically being a hard money. They're both really hard. Bitcoin is going to be, as a, as we've said already, harder after the next halvening. But it, it is like the higher the stock to flow ratio, right? Because there was oh, yeah, the, my bad, my because bad. there was even twice or three times a mistake. He is going to be corrected in the next version. I, I was the actual first one who who uh, who said that that he um, Safed and Moose made that mistake. He he mixed it up uh, instead of saying higher or highest or whatever. He said lower, so it's it's actually the higher the stock to flow ratio, the harder it is, yeah. right? Um, Just for clarification. Uh, yeah, I, uh, is it right? I, I don't, yeah, I think so. Yes, because the stock to flow ratio, for example, of gold is approximately fifty-eight to sixty. So, and and Bitcoin will supersede, will you know exceed that? Yeah, stock that's to flow true. Ratio yeah, right. Yeah, my bad. My bad. True. Yeah, yeah. So basically. Yeah, this stock to flow and the, the focus on that, basically the focus on hard money, it is a commonality of Bitcoin and gold. But the the most obvious difference is obvious is the digital nature. The digital nature of Bitcoin solves a lot of problems gold has. And this is what I think people who are gold bucks or advocating for gold don't realize that this digital nature solves First of the, the storage problem that gold suffers a lot from, meaning if you want to self store your gold, obviously you can do it, but it gets difficult, especially with large quantities. It's, it's really not, not practical to secure them all by your own. And it's costly to do it and they can get stolen pretty easy. Like it's not, it's not great. And that's the first big problem. So there you need, you need a bank, basically, you need someone to, to hold, hold them in a big secure vault for you. And that's, that's the first big difference that gets solved with the digital nature of Bitcoin. And the second, in my opinion, big difference is the verification aspect. I've already kind of talked about it. You cannot in practice verify if you get gold that it is, uh, yeah, that is just real gold. And with Bitcoin, you can do it. Just run your own full node and it's fine. With gold, you cannot do it. And that's a big problem. And people, gold bucks obviously say you wouldn't trade gold on the street. And that's mm -hmm. obviously true. You would trade, let's say, banknotes backed by gold as we have had already in the past. But 
the problem still remains the same then you cannot verify that those banks really have gold and if you let's say go to the bank and, and tell them you want your gold back if you're lucky they will give it to you but even then we are back at the verification problem you need to go to someone else ask them you know, is this is real is this what i've got real and all of those things get solved in my opinion elegantly through bitcoin and its digital nature and the uh the full node process basically right and you have the problem with gold that yeah how do you as you said you know how are you going to assay or validate the purity the authenticity of the gold unless of course you know we'd have an app that you can you know reliably trust a technology that that everybody can at any time validate the whatever 99.99 percent .99 purity of gold mm. but otherwise i have to trust go to a certified gold dealer merchant mm. trust that his technology his whatever apparatus machine is you know the, that gives you like the the, yeah. the results that you have to trust upon right is he's going to tell you yeah it's you know, whatever you know so it's a lot of practical difficulties yeah, it's, it's here really right? people are and i i think it's kind of maybe not dishonest but it's definitely getting close to it when when people who are advocating for gold like hand wave all of these problems it's really not not an easy problem to to solve and i don't think it's solvable just because of the the, the nature of gold let's say and the and the properties that come with it so that's that's basically why i think we need bitcoin and I mean, the, the, the argument most gold people have against Bitcoin is obviously that it's really experimental. You, it's new. No one basically knows what's going on. And that's true. And uh, gold is, let's say, time tested. But the what most people are missing basically is that, yeah, gold is time tested, but it has failed. That's basically per definition what happened because otherwise it would be on the gold standard right now. and we are not that's basically where gold failed and and we also had confiscation i mean it's you know yeah that's history could repeat it itself yeah that that's what i mean that's what i mean mm -hmm. people who are saying gold has been around for a long time and advocating for it they, they have a point in the sense that the value is let's say more stable than bitcoin but if if, if we talk about time tested it has failed in the past other, otherwise, we would be using gold-backed notes right now if, it, if, if, if there were not these, these big problems of centralization that come with the, the physical properties of gold. And that's where, I would, uh, that's where I would point people who are really into gold to basically look at the history, look what happened. And then people like Peter Schiff, for example, who... who have their own solutions with, with their vaults of gold and sending them digitally, basically just sending the ownership digitally, thinking that's an easy solution to the, uh, to the problem. Don't realize that the, the real problem is not the usability, let's say, with running around with a gold, uh, gold in your hand. That's easy to solve. The problem is decentralization that you cannot, you cannot decentralized gold basically that's that's the thing and as we've seen in the past it leads to the government confiscating it or just just showing up at your at your door or the bank's door <laughs> with a lot of guns and then it's it's getting difficult mm -hmm. um so to wrap this up if you would zoom out where, where do you see bitcoin going in the next 10 years uh, when you look at the macro environment the uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 as it's called, the negative interest rate, the quantitative easing, uh, all this, all these de de devastating things that are yeah, going I'm, on. I, I mean, it's really difficult. I don't, I don't like to make like too specific predictions about the future because basically no one knows what's going on in the present even and then Obviously, no one knows what's happening in the future, but there are some things you can you can definitely bet on breaking, as uh, Nassim Taleb obviously alludes a lot to p things that are fragile are going to break in the long run, and I do think that's going to happen. So 
quantitative easing, all of this inflation stuff and hyperinflation, as we've seen in Venezuela, it's going to get a lot. We're going to see a lot more of this kind of stuff. All of this mismanagement, all of this printing money can obviously not go on forever. Everyone knows that basically, basically everyone, even people working with banks, kind of know it. They just don't care, basically. And I do think that all of this is going, going to break down in the next 10 years, definitely. And that we, we are going to, people are going to see the need for Bitcoin, basically. So why do we need Bitcoin? They, they're seeing it with their own eyes. This is what people who live their childhood in countries where hyperinflation was a big thing. You don't, you don't need to explain to those people why we need Bitcoin. They saw it with their own eyes that you cannot let government have control of it because it's going to be hyperinflation. They're going to print money as much as they can. And this is going to be a bad outcome. So when this happens more and more, and it's probably going to happen or very likely going to happen in a lot of Western countries, Europe, America, then we are going to see the same thing. People, people don't, don't need basically that education that we are trying to give them. We are trying to warn them right now, telling them it's bad if they have control, it's going to, going to get to hyperinflation or it's going to crash the economy. And some people are obviously listening and it's great and they can save themselves by buying Bitcoin right now. But if it's all going to happen and if some, some, some country starts and everything, let's say, breaks down, it, it doesn't have to be that dramatical, but it's going to be not, not pretty, I think. And then we don't have to tell people anymore. They're going to see, yeah, we need a reliable store of value. What, what can I do to save, to save me, basically, to save me? And Bitcoin is hopefully going to be ready for this, for this big challenge to come. And as an as it as it's called asymmetric uncorrelated asset, it's like what do you have to lose, right? If you just put a minimal percentage of whatever for institutional investors, ultra not high worth individuals, like one or two or whatever percent, as a what do we call it? Safe haven, uh, bet hedge or whatever. Right? Yeah, it, this is going to uh, it's it's an easy decision basically because. It's if, if anything goes wrong with the current monetary system, you still have Bitcoin basically. And that's, that's what most people should do. And that's what, what betting, being bullish on Bitcoin is being bearish on all the monetary policy of government and federal reserve basically. So if you, if you like what they're doing, keep buying stocks, keep buying keep keep your US dollar but if you don't like what they're doing and think it's kind of fishy invest in Bitcoin at least a little of your savings and then if if things get serious you can you can see the need for more you can buy more and that's I think a great a great way to start great great wonderful really enjoyed this talk uh, Sven uh, I want to in conclusion tell my listeners where they can find you your resources, your links, uh, and any other information you want to give my listeners? Yeah, so basically you can f you can just find me on Twitter at Sven Schneiders. I'm sure it's going to be in the show notes Definitely. or something like that. And you can find, I have a website where I publish my essays. It's called limitlesscuriosity.com. <laughs> kind of my... Sounds like a movie, huh? Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's my, my motto, let's say. I just, I'm really curious. So mm -hmm. that's what I write about. And yeah, that, that's all you can do. If you are in Vienna, you can come to, to the meetup I organize, Bitcoin Vienna. It can also be found on Twitter. And on Telegram. And on Telegram, that's the Telegram group. Yeah, that's it. I would say. All right. Looking forward to seeing you at the Value of Bitcoin conference. Oh, yeah, also, right, it's right. Be a yeah, really in fascinating because uh, there's going to be an ex uh, member of the European Central Bank there. So, yeah, it's going to be a very True. fruitful discussion. If you're in Vienna listening, you can come to the Value of Bitcoin 
See on March see 5th, 2020 in Palais Esterhaze, whatever. So we'll uh, put those in the show. See me there notes. debate some, some gold bucks <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully uh, convince them that Bitcoin is the way better technology. Let's Definitely. see. <laughs> Bitcoin is monetary evolution. I mean, there's nothing to change that. So thank you so much again, Sven. And thank you. you Sven. Hey there. So how'd you like, how'd you love my talk with Smash Needers? I really enjoyed it. It really break, it really capable of breaking down things. Um, also, you know, when it comes to explaining things, terminology, especially for noobs, for Bitcoin beginner, anybody who's open-minded and curious, right? So make sure you check out his website, his blog, limitlesscuriosity.com, put it in the show notes and uh, give him a follow. Share, like, subscribe, retweet, whatever you do. Please help me in any shape or form. If you're an ethical Bitcoin sponsor, get in touch with me. Hello at the totalconnector.com. And yeah, looking really forward to seeing uh, so Sven uh, during the panel discussion, which I'm going to co-moderate. And um, all of you, any any of you, any of your Bitcoiners, if you're nearby, you know, drop by the, the, uh, the symposium uh, in Vienna on March 5th, 2020. Uh, if you want a discount of the regular price is connector 20 and yeah really excited to you know um, have Sven on again it was a brilliant talk fascinating insights and hope we can repeat this in a very new future with other topics into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin all right my name is Kevin Devani this is total Bitcoin mm -hmm.